they still wouldn't surrender. <laughs> As one Roman poet put it, the victor is not victorious if, if the you can't declare that you're not lost. Consider himself so. Yeah, you you're not a loser as long as you say you're not. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm not vanquished. <laughs> what are you talking about? It is nothing but a flesh wound. <laughs> How's it going, people? Jack here with another reaction today to check out some more from Oversimplified, this time on the second part of the First Punic War. Now, the first one was super entertaining. The Romans, with the way that they uh, reverse engineered the Carthaginian technology, with the boats of course and just the go-getter attitude the tenacity pretty awesome to to learn about and additionally of course the genius and uh, the massive wealth which might kind of come back biting them in the arse i suppose since they were mainly a trading nation so they don't have much else to lean on if the war continues so that is going to be interesting to learn about but that being said though this is part two let us jump just straight into it oh Actually, a little mention, somebody left in the comment uh, regarding the first video and my kind of uh, worry about the video being demonetized and copyright stricken. This has happened to me. It is a third party and I learned about this even further by following what you mentioned in the comment. Thank you very much for referring to the vlogging historian or vlogging through history who actually uh, faced something similar to that to the point where they even wanted to have copyright strike his channels to termination. And obviously this is not something that I want to be dealing with too much. I tried to appeal the video. I don't know if that appeal is going to uh, amount to anything most likely not i'm still going to leave the video up, but it, it's fine with me if uh, oversimplify at least is the one who gets the revenue from this my only issue with things usually getting a copyright strike is that they don't get shown to people that much because that's literally how the algorithm works but whatever it is done and uh, let's just get watching part two after the gigantic battle at Cape Ecnomis, the Romans were now free to land on African soil. And so, they did. The Carthaginians chose to focus on defending the city of Carthage itself. So the Romans immediately took the city of Aspis, Aspis. and were then free to raid and plunder the countryside. They took over 20,000 slaves and a ton of booty. booty. But then, some orders arrived from the Senate. Oh, what do you know? The, the thing that I mentioned in the first video there. That's the, uh, the first plushie. Nice. Send home the booty. Oh, but I want to <laughs> stay. Steve. No, Steve, not you. They mean the treasure. Well, we are not watching any more of this filth. Wait, Steve is just squatting a lot. That's what happens to every big boys. You get ass no matter what you do. That's just training. So the other consul left with the booty, leaving Regulus and his forces on their own, and they began advancing towards Carthage. Along the way, according to the ancient writer Livy, they encountered a literal dragon. Oh. Now Livy was a Roman historian, so his account may be slightly exaggerated, but this... One of the, one of the most interesting part of our history is the concept of like objectivity within history. You know, the more and more historians write about something, the more there tends to be a, uh, a common held understanding of things, a consensus, that's what it's called. But the consensus is of course also change when it comes to like uh, new proof, new evidence that is found through excavation or uh, whatever better writings that are more accurate to the tradition or the society that one has been studying at the time. And one thing that is interesting is uh, how one of the very common thing is always like the encounters of mythological creatures and or stuff like serpents that are mentioned. Like just about every cultures have that. You will like go and find somewhere in the far Congo where they have something about some giant snakes which just were simply embellished just a little bit enough to make it so that they became like the mythological creature that matches with um, some culture's culture. <laughs> and the mentioning of dragons and or further things like serpents can even happen when the reconstruction of the new thing has occurred because then you need to retell the story from the perspective of the original author and it, it gets a little bit complicated but I hope that you get my point here. But he did have something here. 
so his account may be slightly exaggerated. Now let's zoom in here a little bit to see what this is actually saying. It's also possibly a translation issue. Perhaps the Bagradas dragon was just a really big snake. Then again, maybe it never happened at all. Uh, a lot of ancient history disputed like that. Yeah, there's also the refusal of the history that can happen. Uh, because, yeah, there's a lot of... <laughs> Uh, fictional things that are included in there but hey since you took the time to pause the video and read this i just want to let you know that you're real swell and i'm sorry i told you to shut up in part one i swear i didn't mean it <laughs> okay that's good to the many people who dislike me pausing this is one of the reasons as to why i'm doing that to notice things like this but this i believe as the Romans continued to plunder, the Carthaginian people flooded into the city. Now, not only was it in a major panic, but it was so crowded, the people began to starve. Ooh. Don't panic, everyone! Look, I know you're all starving, but I still have food for me. So, you know, it's not all bad. <laughs> what a douche. Things weren't looking good for Carthage. They had to do something to stop the Romans rampaging throughout their land. Oh, wow. So they decided the excavator. Finally, it was time to put an end to it. They headed out and set up on rough hilly terrain overlooking the Roman camp. And they prepared for Derpy battle. horses. Now, while the Carthaginians were the traditional masters of the sea, on land, they weren't always the brightest. Uh, yeah. Case in point, setting up in this position overlooking the Roman camp was just about the stupidest thing they could have done. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, there's something you gotta understand about Carthage. The Carthaginian land forces actually suffered from a multitude of different issues. First of all, since the Carthaginians were rich, 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 they could afford to pay a huge number of foreign mercenaries to fight for them. Yeah, that's a big problem. Then comes the language barrier. People cannot follow orders and subsequent to that comes mistrust that is seated amongst people, right? As soon as a battle is lost or somebody's at a disadvantage, we can just leave. Like, you don't have the money to pay us to stay here. That, that, that can easily occur. Oh boy, this is bad. These mercenaries actually made up the vast majority of Carthage's forces. And therefore, Carthage's land armies were a melting pot of many different cultures. Yeah. This, however, meant that if a battle wasn't going their way, there could be loyalty issues. Ooh. Man, I ain't getting paid enough for this. You Balearic slingers better not be thinking of running away. What did he say? I don't know. I don't, I don't speak Phoenician. Let's get out of here. Oof. Clearly, there were also language issues. The military mm -hmm. generals tended to be Carthaginian, but they the made a lot of strange decisions. For example, one of the most feared assets of the Carthaginian army were the war elephants. To a Roman soldier who had never even seen an elephant before, this was like fist fighting, a literal monster. Yo, that's bad. Oh no, what are they doing? What are they doing here? Yet the Carthaginians continually kept placing the elephants in the rear, where they were no use. In a similar fashion, the neighboring region of Numidia provided Carthage with the most skilled cavalrymen in the world. But oh, the Carthaginians the rough, often chose to fight on rough, uneven terrain, where horses and elephants were less effective. That is so dumb. Like... Okay, so for it's easy to say now as somebody who has read about history and know about these things, but like there were individuals in the past who did these strategies better that they could have learned from. The Greek did that. I'm certain that some of you might have heard of the name Demetrius before, right? Demetrius of Bactria, who was uh, named, funnily enough, the uh, unconquered king or the inventable king who defeated the elephants from India. There are quaints made out of him, uh, made out of him, <laughs> the quaints made of him with his likeness wearing an elephant, uh, elephant skin on his head to prove that. And uh, always, whenever I'm thinking about the um, 
uh, uh, video by Bill Words about the history of the entire world. You have the, the Gupta Empire in India. They made use of those war elephants as well. Later on, of course, in history, we are going to see such things as uh, the battle in 300, where the Persians also made use of war elephants. They put them in the right place. But like in the case of Demetrius, we are talking about battles that were waged back before like the year 200 and so BC. So like they have had 200 years of preparing for this. They could have at least put them in the front. Now, I can imagine the reason why they didn't do that is that the, the elephants are precious. They, they care about the money the most, so they don't want to waste them. But it's like, come on. And so, in this case, when the Carthaginians again chose the rough terrain near the Roman camp, the Romans easily sent them packing. Wow, Regulus, we're mere miles from Carthage. You sure are amazing. Yes, Steve, I know. <sighs> Steve? Steve what's the matter? That ass. <laughs> We've almost won. I just wish I could be as great as you, Regulus. Steve, you're amazing. I mean, look at this thing. <laughs> the it's <dumb> unbelievable. <laughs> I know, but I mean, like, at war stuff. I'm That's such funny. a noob. My tanks always get blown up. I can't even fly an aircraft Boy. straight. Uh, tanks? Aircraft? Well, Funda. What are you talking about, Steve? I'm talking about free-to-play online multiplayer combat game and this video's sponsor War Thunder Thank you to all of the game reviewers who have been playing this game They have made me mentally prepared to spot a War Thunder ad from a distance War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made Don't just drive the tank Become one with the tank mm -hmm. You can play as more than 2,000 battleships, aircraft, tanks, and helicopters in dynamic player versus player combat. What do you think would have happened if the Romans got to play War Thunder? They would have given all of their plans away to the Carthaginians, eh? They would have lost the war. Years of military development from the 1920s to the present day. I love the detailed damage mechanics in War Thunder. You ever think about how the exact angle a shell hits an armored vehicle affects the resulting damage? Yeah, War sometimes. Thunder has. Every bullet and shell is simulated with realistic destruction. That's the kind of thing that gets me up in the morning. <laughs> and by using my link in the description below, oh, new and existing users can get an exclusive oversimplified decal to make their T-50 tank look extra spicy. Plus, yeah. you'll get a huge bonus pack, including premium vehicles and boosters. So play War Thunder now on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. And as always, by using my link, you'll be supporting my channel. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Now where were we? Oh yeah. Invading Africa, getting some booty, and sending the Carthaginians packing. Everything was looking up for Regulus. According to plan. victory seemed like it was only a matter of time. But then, Regulus realized something. He had been consul for almost a year, mm -hmm. and his term was coming to an end. Oh he knew that if his successor took over and he finished the job, then he would get the naked statues, not Regulus. And there was no way Regulus was going to allow that. Politics always stepping in the way. It is kind of sad, isn't it? I think that we constantly see in at least our more modern history, with uh, the way that many regions in the world have been split post-war, post-World War, for example, World War II, the dispute between the US and the USSR, which, who, who was going to take which part of the world and which uh, political alignment should be the dominant one. Those things have always affected how and when certain areas were to be liberated. That's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an annoying thing, isn't it? Like, they could have stopped the war early, but you had to plan things instead. So he jumped the gun. You there, Carthaginian boy. I want you to deliver a message to your elders. I, Marcus Atilius Regulus, demand the total and unconditional surrender of Carthage. Unconditional <laughs> surrender? Jeez, at least lay siege and starve us all to death first. Just deliver the message, you punk. He demands your total surrender. What? Jeez, at least lay siege and starve us all to death first. Hey, that's what I hey. said. Well, boys, this Roman thinks we're out. But we're not out, are we, boys? No. 
We'll do what we always do in times like this. Hire somebody else to solve our problems but for us. But of course. Darren, bring in the Spartan. Oh. Nice. Regulus's overly harsh demands had had the unintended effect of reinvigorating Carthaginian resolve. They brought in a mercenary from the famed land of Sparta named Xanthippus to help Xanthippus. dig them out of this situation. And we all know what Spartans are like. <laughs> Gerald Butler, <laughs> hailing from the Scottish part of Sparta. <laughs> I'll never get it. I'll never get over the, their accents in the movie. It's so weird. And also the fact that it was, well, wasn't it, it was based on a comic, right? A comic that was supposed to make fun of the way that many war movies were depicted about like the ancient world. I need to remember the origin of the 300. It's so ridiculous, just the depiction that was made out of the Spartans, but, I mean, it made for a good action movie. <laughs> Xanthippus showed up and immediately took charge. He had a look around and said, You idiots! Put the elephants in front of the army so they can smash into the Romans yeah. and stop fighting on rough, uneven terrain. Find a big, flat field so your superior cavalry can do their job. And what's this I hear about you giving a speech telling everyone they're gonna die? Hey! I was just telling the people the truth. You're a politician. <laughs> Lie to the people. Ah, and wow. And so Xanthippus led out the newly reformed Carthaginian army to meet That's Regulus great. in the Battle of the Bagradas River. The elephants, now in the front, smashed into the Roman lines, causing disarray. The cavalry, with total freedom of movement, outflanked the Roman infantry. Thanks to this impressive Spartan, the battle was a total Carthaginian victory and Xanthippus for his stunning victory was forced to flee Carthage because the leadership got jealous why Regulus the Roman consul was wait hold on you can't just get over that like that like I've never heard of Xanthippus before hold on let's see Xanthippus oh here Xanthippus Spartan commander Xanthippus was a Spartan mercenary a uh, general employed by Carthage during the First Punic War, he led the Carthaginian army to considerable success against the Roman Republic during the course of the war. Blah 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 blah, let's go further, anything about his death here? Uh, yes, he inspired courage and led an attack defeating the Romans. Jealous of Xanthippus' success, the city betrayed him by giving him a leaky ship and supposedly sank in the Adriatic Sea on his voyage home. Wow. So they sent him packing, giving him a leaking ship where he then died. Uh, Cilicius Attilicus writes that Xanthippus was originally from the Amiclean in Laconia. Oh, those are the, um, what they call the Polyponnesian cities there around Athens and so. Uh, but this may be as well as an invention for metric convenience. He also says that he had three sons, Xanthippus, named, uh, well, Xanthippus, and another one, another one called Amicus and Critias, who served under Hannibal. Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, vengeance. I smell vengeance here. Yeah, Hannibal is part of the Second Punic War. So, yeah, I I'm looking forward to this. This is interesting. He was captured during the battle. Legend has it, he was brought before the Carthaginian council, and they made a proposition. Well, Reggie, not looking so good anymore, is it? Reggie. Looks like we beat you pretty bad, huh? <laughs> Up yours, you Punic pansies. <laughs> now, now, Regulus. Nobody likes a sore loser, do they? No. How about this? We're gonna send you back to Rome, and you convince the Roman Senate to surrender to us. If you fail, though, you gotta come back so we can torture you to death. Okay? Okay. You promise? <laughs> oh, I no. promise. <laughs> hey, guys. No. Whoa, Regulus! We thought you got captured. I did, but they sent me back to convince you to surrender. Well, should we? Surrender? No. no. Never surrender. Give them hell, boys. They're at the end of their rope. Anyway, I gotta go be tortured to death now. What? Yep, part of a deal I made. It's a long story. Oh, hey, wait! Regulus! No, no, it's cool, guys. I promised. Regulus! This is ancient times. Yeah? We massacre entire populations 
We chop pets in half. And you children. Can break a promise. No, Tim. You never break a promise. That's too much. That's too far. That's crazy. And it's true, unfortunately. There were so many weird customs for, like, honor that were being made despite how barbaric a lot of the practices were. And that's like one of the issues that I have usually when I, I did mention in the first, um, in the first video that uh, my, my take about all these things will most likely come from a point of view of somebody who is uh, somewhat at least educated within theology because at least you, you need to know about the culture about uh, of things, certain historical factors and so on. And like... <laughs> Through the theology and the practices that many led there, you find uh, so many freaking things that were super immoral. But then these people are gonna just say that, well, excuse it with the fact that, well, this was just the practice that they did back then. Yeah, uh, sure, that's how time works. It was a different time. But the thing that it did was still freaking wrong. <laughs> Like, you would never expect somebody to do this. And so, Regulus went back to Carthage and was tortured to death. And for keeping his promise, he was immortalized as the leading symbol of Roman virtue. Wow. Meanwhile, after their defeat in Africa, the remaining Roman survivors, still in Africa, were still in Africa, and they needed to be rescued. So the Romans sent their fleet to pick him up and bring him home. They successfully fended off a Carthaginian fleet, grabbed the survivors, and made their way to Sicily. Mm. A great success. But then, things took a turn for the worse. Uh, sir? That cloud looks kind of angry. Fear not, Don't coward. say. If we Romans can build a war fleet from scratch and defeat the Carthaginian Empire at their own oh, no. game, why then even Mother Nature herself will crumble before us. I laugh in the face of Mother Nature. Ha <laughs> ha! See? Come on, guys. Do laugh not. Laugh at Mother Nature with me. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> yep. And she laughs back. She is one hell of a bitch, isn't she? Mother Nature. She doesn't take. She doesn't take very kindly to that kind of uh, attitude. <laughs> 284 ships, nearly 80% of the Roman fleet was destroyed. Whoa. As many as 100,000 men drowned in a terrifying act of nature. Never before had Rome lost so many men in a single incident. 100,000 casualties for any other nation would be crippling. Any other nation would hastily sue for peace. Any other nation that would spend Rome. decades trying to recover. But Rome was not just any other nation. Infamous for its unrelenting determination in the face of overwhelming odds, Rome said, well, I guess we'll just have to build another fleet. Oh, no. Did. In just three months, they <gasps> built 220 more ships. That's crazy. <laughs> Yo, the Romans are insane. Like, I understand about their go-get attitude, but come on, man. That's wild. Hopefully they chose a different time to set sail. An astonishing feat. The Romans sent out their brand spanking new war fleet and... They got caught in another storm. This time, a whole nother fleet was lost. <sighs> and still, the Romans did not give up. The Carthaginians couldn't believe it. <laughs> their enemy had just lost hundreds of thousands of men had two fleets almost entirely destroyed, and they still wouldn't surrender. <laughs> As one Roman poet put it, the victor is not victorious if, if the you can't declare that you're not lost. consider himself so. Yeah, you, you're not a loser as long as you say you're not. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm not vanquished. <laughs> what are you talking about? It is nothing but a flesh wound. <laughs> yeah, the Anglo-Saxons. Part of I uh, actually interesting uh, as a little bit of an extra fact um, since the Byzantine Empire comes to a lot later than this uh, they too did engage in a similar thing that uh, the Carthaginians then did by employing different um, different cultures as uh, part of their army uh, this is actually a fact that I learned very recently while we were visiting a museum the Bavarian Guard 
if you've ever heard about those, they were like a, a, a bunch of Vikings who were working under the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, pretty cool. And uh, of course, there were some Anglo-Saxons involved there. In typical Roman fashion, after a short break, they were once again building another fleet. However, for now, after all the disasters at sea, the focus began shifting back to the land campaign mm. in Sicily. The Carthaginians, overconfident from recent successes, attempted to retake Panormus, but the Romans countered the terrifying war elephants by throwing stuff at them oh. and scaring them away. <laughs> Having stopped the Carthaginian advance, the road was now open to the final Carthaginian stronghold on the island, Lilibium. Lilibium was an extremely well-fortified city. In 250 BC, the Romans laid siege. The Carthaginian defense, however, was fierce, Ooh. and skilled blockade runners kept the city supplied. Progress was so slow that the siege would last another nine years. To make matters Whoa. worse, the Carthaginians later sent possibly the greatest military general of the time, a man named Hamilcar Barca, to the island. He engaged in a skillful campaign of guerrilla warfare behind enemy lines, and for the remainder of the war, he was a major thorn in the Roman side. Hamilcar Barca. That's Hannibal, Hannibal's dad, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. For now, with the deadlock siege at Lilibium and the new Roman fleet at sea, things seemed to be at a standstill, and the Romans had to do something to break the deadlock. Thankfully, the Roman consul, Clodius Pulcher, had an idea. He okay. tried to get things moving by attacking the Carthaginian fleet at Trapana. Now, before a battle, to predict if they would win, it was common for the Romans to look for signs from the gods. This could mean observing the weather or inspecting some cow livers. Yeah, you know, religious typical stuff. religion stuff. <laughs> In this case, Pulcher reportedly tried to feed some sacred chickens, but unfortunately for him, they wouldn't <laughs> eat a crumb. They can smell the shifting winds like birds. <laughs> I mean, they can't set flight, but <laughs> they can smell. <laughs> Thus, they don't want to participate in any of that. <laughs> a very bad sign. Well... He said, if they won't eat, then let them drink, stupid chickens. We'll observe the weather instead. Gods, give me a sign. Uh, Don't say so. Okay, how about this? If I can get this piece of paper into that trash basket, we'll win. Kobe. Okay, if I can stand here he silently for five seconds and do nothing, we'll win. <laughs> ah, it. Pulcher chose to ignore the signs from the gods, and in the following battle, the superior Carthaginians tore them to shreds. It also Ooh, betrayed by your own bowel movements. <laughs> That's the worst fate. That's a fate worse than death. <laughs> didn't help that by now the Romans had removed the Corvus to stabilize their ships, Aww. and without their secret weapon, it was a disaster, and Pulcher was disgraced. To make matters worse, the victorious Carthaginian fleet then went on to intercept a Roman supply fleet on its way to Lilibium. As they approached, however, they saw the signs of an incoming storm, so they took shelter. The Romans, on the other hand, said, Onward, men! No, said, not again. We've got to deliver these supplies stat. But sir, those clouds, don't you think we ought to have learned our lesson by now? Yes, Brian, we ought to have. But... We haven't. We haven't. Another fleet and 50,000 men lost in another storm. Yikes. Disaster. Now, at this point, there still really isn't a clear winner. Sure, the Romans have captured most of Sicily and cornered the Carthaginian land forces at Lilibium, but the continued disasters at sea were critically depleting their resources, and without a strong fleet, Rome could not win. Meanwhile, Hamilcar Barca was still knocking about and creating even more problems. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? How does this war finally end? By now, the two sides had been fighting for 23 years. Yeah. They were exhausted. Their money, their resources, their strength were all utterly spent. Basically a war the of attrition. The in particular were eager to see the war end so they could get <gasps> back to trading and making money. Boy. Uh, this, this, this is the problem. This is the problem. That's why throughout history it's, it's always been weird. Like it, countries that don't have like uh, straight up their own military always were in trouble. 
always, especially in the face of expansionists like this. So after the latest Roman disaster at sea, they said, look, there ain't no way in heck the Romans can come back again. Let's make they some can't money. They possibly afford to build another fleet. They're done. That's it. Recall the navy, repurpose them as merchant ships, and let's get back to making some money. <laughs> Assuming the Romans would soon Wrong make move. peace, an anti-war faction within the government recalled a large portion of the navy, leaving Hamilcar on his own. The victors appeared to be declaring themselves victorious. Meanwhile, the vanquished were getting ready for round five. The Romans built another fleet, this time heavily relying on patriotic donations from the upper classes to afford it. And once again, they put to sea. Uh, sir, the Romans have built another fleet. Oh, for goodness sake, Clarence, can't you see I'm busy rolling around in this pile of money? But sir, I don't care anymore, Clarence. I just don't. Care. The Carthaginian politicians made a fairly lackluster final effort with a poorly built fleet to supply their forces in Sicily. But when the brand new Roman fleet caught them at the Battle of the Agates, even without their signature Corvus, they dealt them the final blow. And that was that. 23 years of war. Neither side could afford to keep fighting, but the Romans showed that they intended to anyway. The Carthaginians had no choice but to throw in the towel. Never give the up. War had been long and hard. The lesson for both of the sides. story. But in the end, it was Roman determination that won the fight. The Romans had spent the entire war trying to find a way to deliver the knockout blow. They learned how to build a fleet and engage in naval combat. They developed ingenious new ways of waging war. They attempted an invasion of the Carthaginian heartland, and whenever disasters struck them, they always came back, again and again. The Carthaginians, on the other hand, spent the entire war watching whatever Rome did, and then figuring out how to respond. They were much more passive, and so, it's no wonder then, that when both sides were close to collapse, Rome was the one who figured out how to go that little bit further. Boy, I love that image there of <laughs> turning Steve into a war elephant. Brilliant. In 241 BC, the Carthaginian politicians sent word to Hamilcar Barca that he was on his own and could choose to make peace with the Romans if he wished. Hamilcar was stunned. He felt betrayed by the politicians. Yeah. Some sources say he refused to even negotiate. Nevertheless, terms had to be drawn up. Well, Hammy, I'm glad you Carthaginians have finally come to your senses and recognized who the true winner is. How many fleets did you lose? Uh, 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 okay, here are our terms. You leave Sicily to us and return all of our prisoners. You're not allowed to make war against Syracuse or her allies, and you have to pay us 2,200 talents of silver over the next 20 years. Wow, that's a lot. That's, that's a crap ton of money. It depends on what point of view you want to look at this, but actually, to be totally fair, regardless of which point, it's still a lot. Like, you can go through the theological point, right, on, uh, let's say, Christianity. Uh, Matthew 25, some of you may know about the whole story about the, um, uh, the talents, the story of the talents, where the uh, owner of a field leaves his three servants, gives one one talent, the other one two, and the last one gets three. And the whole point is, uh, figuratively speaking, that you are not supposed to be burying your talent and actually make use of what God gave you. But uh, if you are a Bible literalist, as so many people are, uh, it's about actually not burying your money on the ground and investing in it. Funnily enough, uh, I'm thinking about the story of uh, a recent uh, pastor couple that scammed uh, their church after millions of dollars. Insane. But uh, that's not the point. The point is that talents were a valuable unit of measurement. Not, it's not just money. It was, of course, there for gold and silver, but it was used for many other things. If you're looking at, um, I think, uh, the Babylonians... Uh, a talent would be around 21 grams of the stuff that you were trying to measure. So imagine 21 grams of silver times that with 2200. You, 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 you have some, you have quite a lot of money. 
or if it is even worse if it's gold. But then again, this is silver talent. So, of the per uh, um, um, over twenty years, that becomes still a lot of money. What's a talent of silver? Well, to put it in perspective, in the year 2022, that'll be worth around, let's say, 40 million US dollars. Hi, <laughs> caramba! That will cripple us! Wow, we got a real smart guy over here. Yeah, that's kind of the point, you dingus. Yeah. Ugh. I guess I have no choice. We gotta pay for the wall damages. Great! Oh, by the way, we changed our minds. You actually have to pay us 3,200 talents of silver no. over 10 years. Thanks no. for accepting. Dude! See you later. Ha hey! You didn't let me say on cool! He didn't let me stay on cool. The treaty was extremely punishing, and by switching up the terms at the last minute, they enraged <gasps> the Carthaginians. But still, one of the longest and deadliest wars at the time was finally over. The Romans had won. They achieved their aim of gaining Sicily, and even though it wasn't part of the peace deal, they took advantage of a weakened Carthage and grabbed Corsica and Sardinia as well. Roman expansion beyond the Italian peninsula had just begun. The Romans hoped that now the Carthaginians would forever be under their thumb. Unfortunately, the Mistakes harsh terms made. they placed on the Carthaginians at the end of the war left a growing anger, one that would come back to haunt them. This makes me think of uh, what we had during World War One, where a lot of the damages were put on uh, Germany to fix, right? Like Germany had lost quite a bit at the time. They were forced to become a republic, which they weren't. They were a monarchy before that. They had lost around 3 million people, uh, at least men, I would say. But perhaps it was also including the citizens. I believe that the toll was 3 million at the time. And then, of course, they were forced to pay uh, for the... Uh, war damages through the Treaty of Versailles. It was something out in the ballpark of like 30 billion dollars. <laughs> Imagine that. That's why it brings up a lot of seeding hatred within people. And if that is not like uh, monitored, it brings up a lot of rage. And I'm not saying that, uh, okay, Please don't misconstrue my statement here. Hannibal, the character that we are likely to be introduced here, is not like a Hitler character at all. But he became a leader that many people looked up to because of the hatred that was passed on to him. One day, Carthage will have its revenge. That's nice, dear. I'm serious, woman. Maybe not in my lifetime, but perhaps in his. <laughs> my beautiful son. Yeah, you I was right. Are born into Hamilcar. a momentous destiny. You shall be Rome's greatest enemy. You'll tear Rome limb from limb. You'll burn their pathetic city into the ground. You'll slaughter their people, men, women, and children. My child, you <laughs> are vengeance. Stop telling Bad our baby man. he's vengeance. But he is, Barbara. He's vengeance. That oh boy, that was so close. That was so close. You could have called her Martha. That would have been funny. <laughs> Maybe so someday. But for now, our son has a name. And you should call him that instead. His name is... That's amazing. <laughs> Don't forget to play War Thunder now by clicking my link in the description below. Get a huge bonus pack including premium vehicles, boosters, and more. I feel so lucky that I get to watch these episodes like back to back, unlike many who had to wait like an entire year for these to come out. They are amazing. Uh, refreshing a lot of like misconception that I had about certain things, uh, namely the Roman history, to which I actually have to make a correction there. Unfortunately, I'm only thinking about it right now, but regarding the Roman aqueduct, I did mention that in the previous video as actually being something as a segue to uh, refute what I said, but it didn't come across that way. Yes, obviously, the water there was not poisoned through the aqueduct. They are still being used in many countries today. Lead, that is. The thing that poisoned them would have either be the high temperatures that was, that was caused by them cooking, uh, employing like... Uh, cooking pots which i think i mentioned and of course because they really really did enjoy the taste of uh, lead that metallic taste was very cool to them apparently but yeah 
they ended up having a lot of uh, medical issues because of that. But yeah, I needed to correct that a little bit. But guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. As always, please do make sure to go and subscribe and or like the original video from Oversimplified. And of course, it is what was somewhat insightful, entertaining or fun for you to watch. I would like it very much if you would uh, give the video a like. That being said though, see you guys in the next one. Bye.